So the dream machine was an idea from an artist called Brian Geisen. As the story goes, he was on a bus uh, going down a really straight tree-lined road on a sunny day and he was falling asleep against the window. He described himself as entering this transcendental state and he saw extraordinary visuals, colours, patterns, kaleidoscopic shapes and as soon as the bus left the trees it stopped. His invention, the dream machine, was really simple. So it was a patterned cylinder that you put on a record player, you hang a light bulb inside, and then the light comes through the holes in the cylinder at the right frequency to, to kind of create this. Rather than seeing it as an object, we're turning this into an experience. One of the most radical things is that we are inviting the public to come in and to shut their eyes and do nothing. One of the great joys of the Dream Machine project is that the scientific and the philosophical aspects have been built into the project from the very beginning. We're investigating a phenomenon that's still not widely understood, how flickering light generates this kaleidoscopic, vivid, immersive range of experiences for people. So we're really making something that is um, internal and quite transcendental and personal into a collective experience. Because of the nature of the experience, we're hoping that what will really happen is that it will engender conversation. And so every stage of the dream machine has been designed in a way to really enable people um, to talk to each other. So I think the general public's minds will be blown by this project. It's so novel, it's so unlike anything else that's been rolled out. And I think the combination of a synchronous light show with this amazing 360 panoramic sound will be an extremely powerful experience. Collaboration and creativity is at the epicenter of this project. This conjoining of um, you know, artists and composers, people that have worked on incredibly well-known creative projects around the UK and indeed around the world. You've got left brain, right brain sort of working together in, in collaboration. What's really exciting is thinking about young people engaging in this and taking part in this and seeing themselves as well in the bigger picture. It's almost something that's trained out of us to ask those massive philosophical questions about life who you are in the world, what it means to be you, how you're connected to others, and really to keep that depth of inquiry in those resources for the classroom. The Perception Census is going to be one of the largest scientific research studies ever carried out into perception. An understanding of the brain, the mind and perception helps us understand why we experience the world the way that we do. I think that the Perception Census is exciting for participants Firstly, because they will learn that we're all unique and we're all different and we all perceive the world in different ways and that's quite eye-opening, I think. And what we also hope to do is to give feedback to participants so that they will understand what their perception is like and how it compares to other people. I think increasingly we absorb culture in, in kind of very like isolated individual ways. Um, you could transition from cinema to TV to phones and I think the opportunity to break that open and to create a, a cultural experience that isn't about consumption, that, that is about self-generation and reflection, is extremely exciting. For me, seeing the responses of participants when they come out the other side of the curtain and they've just had this experience and they look to each other or, or they look at us, it's just so rare and so magical um, that, that someone can have that surprise in their life and, and that you can share in that moment. What's happening in the dream machine is a white light going on and off but the experiences that people were reporting and how emotionally affecting they are how joyous they are is really profound um, realization that you know what you're capable of and that we have this incredible incredible organ Professor Anil Seth and his team at the University of Sussex, they'd actually been experimenting with and exploring the phenomena of um, flickering light for like the last decade and still trying to research, you know, why this happens and what underlies it. So they were like a crucial bit of the jigsaw. Culturally, the phenomenon goes back probably hundreds of thousands of years uh, to Cult, people sitting around a campfire looking into sparks of the flames and, and having sorts of experiences. But in, in neuroscience in the 1950s, William Gray Walter describes this phenomenon of strobe light on, on, on closed eyes 
And he also suggests that the, the reason for the phenomenon is that the strobe light is entraining, it's sort of imposing a beat on some of the brain's natural rhythms, especially when your eyes are closed. So many people have described this as a sort of resting state of the visual brain, and it's associated with relaxation. What do you think the dream machine can teach us about how our minds work and how we work as humans in general? One thing we think is going on, uh, along with others who study this, is that the aspects of the visual wiring of the brain, like the, the underlying anatomy, seems to be revealing itself in the experience, the, the, the shapes, the lines, the, the, the patterns of movement that that you see can be tied to the underlying structure of the visual cortex. It can tell us a lot about the range of different experiences people can have. So we all have different perceptual experiences of the shared world. Now the dream machine, I think, just brings those differences to light in a, in a beautiful and creative way. So in the dream machine, it's quite evident people have describably unique experiences. This recognition of diversity is, has potentially pretty significant consequences for how we operate in society. You know, we all sort of connect with each other on the basis of the assumption that we see the same world, but we don't necessarily always see the same world. And understanding these differences can be a catalyst, I think, for, for better communication between people.